first of all, disclaimer for everyone here. If you're here thinking I'm talking about IP as internet protocol, I hate to make you disappointed, but this is IP as in intellectual property, not IP internet protocol. So we're not doing that talk. Uh, it would be very strange to use OpenChain as a management tool for, for, I, for that kind of IP. Uh, so anyhow, uh, just to gauge the room, is everyone familiar with OpenChain already? Seeing most people are good. We, we'll anyhow cover what OpenChain is, just as sort of covering the fundamentals so everyone is, is comfortable with what we're talking about. Uh, but starting here, I have a confession to make. I am a former patent guy. I used to work with the IP department of Ericsson, the patent department. Uh, I did that for a long time uh, before joining the Ericsson OSPO. So these are sort of my observations on how OpenChain is useful to get your OSPO or your open source compliance team to talk to your IP team. Because in terms of compliance, both teams share a lot in common in terms of goals. They, they both have the goal of reducing risk for the company uh, by good compliance. But open source is seen as sort of a strange thing for, for the IP department, so they don't really understand it. So they could really become a valuable ally to you in, in terms of getting pro compliance processes implemented and getting the company to take this seriously. But we'll, we'll get there in this talk. So, um, some of you have seen this slide before because I always do it because it's a very good slide and I like to reuse. So this is the open source awareness curve at the IP function in the company or the IP department. So the first stage is we don't use open source. Do we? I think that everyone sooner or later comes to realize that we use open source. Not only do we use open source, we use a lot of open source. Extreme amounts of open source. In, in our company, it's 80 to 90 percent open source in our products in terms of lines of code. So the next stage you enter into bargaining as an IP person. Can we please stop doing this? It's strange. I don't understand it. I don't want us using this. I only see risk here. Uh, no, we're, we're not going to stop using open source. You'd be laughed at out, laugh out of the, uh, the room if you have suggested that to engineers, right? So what can you do? You enter the depression stage. We are screwed. We can stop using open source. I don't understand it. How should I do? Hopefully you emerge somewhere on, on the other side. It's sort of the acceptance stage in, okay, we need to be smart about this and we need to develop strategies and processes to manage open source and manage the associated IP risk that comes with it. So I want to show in this talk sort of how open chain is a very useful tool to get IP people to the, the acceptance stage where we offer them sort of a full methodology of doing it. And we do it in, in, in the boring form of an ISO standard. So of course it must be good because it's an ISO standard, right? We need to take that, that seriously. So uh, what's my job? Um, I think this is sort of relevant for, for this talk as well in terms of how, how I view myself as, as sort of an IP person going fully to the open source side and, and sort of what I'm able to do and, and sort of how I view it. I'm partly a lawyer, I'm partly a guardian for, for the, the IP, I'm partly an enabler of us making open source contributions, partly I try to solve problems, uh, I'm a bit of a psychologist to people, a bit of a technologist to lawyers, I know more technology than them, I don't know more technology than my engineers definitely, but I'm, I'm at least able to translate sometimes. Gardner in the sense that we need to grow an internal culture around open source. Translator in terms of trying to translate what does this mean in the open source context to what does this mean in the IP context and, and how do we get people talking to, around, to each other. And I think everyone here can relate to the fact that we're all sort of cultural anthropologists in the sense that we live among this strange tribe of open source people observing how they work, right? So I want to also say a few words about my employer, Ericsson, and just why sort of it's relevant when, when the context I'm talking about when I talk about IP and Ericsson, because for us, it's, it's a huge uh, business asset. So we have, um, this is, is just some facts about the company. We don't have to, to spend too much time here, but we can move on to 
I thought I had a slide on that. Apparently, I, I did not have a slide on that. Uh, ah, here it is. Sorry, the number in in terms of patents, we have more than sixty thousand granted patents worldwide, and we generate about a billion U.S. dollars a year in licensing revenue for those. So, of course, our our IP division is our patent department is is very much driving a business of their own, right? That need that's an asset that needs to be protected. So we need to balance our open source need versus our IP needs and, and get both to support each other. Um, so how have things happened in Ericsson? What this is sort of our open source journey? We have, as, as many other have covered here today, we've gone from seeing it as, as technology supply, it's just something we pick up, it's something we use, to being realizing <laughs> there is it's no free lunch, we need to be part of it, we need to be contributing here, and in terms of of joining up and being part of the community and contributing and, and sort of all these things have led us to get there eventually and virtualization of the networks has really been been a key driver in that. Uh, in terms of, of the volume of open source we use at Ericsson, we have that have sort of scaled and trended upwards immensely as well uh, from 6,000 uh, components and components doesn't then include dependencies, it's just top level individual components that are being brought in. 6,000 in 2006 to 22,000 and on track to be a lot more than that in, uh, to, uh, in uh, 23. Uh, so we consume a lot of open source, we have a lot of patents, they generate a lot of value. Those are our three key ta takeaways so far. Uh, some of the projects that are super relevant for us is sort of seen here. Um, I think a lot of the projects are, are represented here today. Uh, the project I care about is the one over there, Open Chain. I care about the other ones as well, but that's that one is, is very close to my heart. Uh, we don't have to cover how we, we are organized, but in terms of over OSPO, it, it sort of, I like to view it as three C's. It, it's consumption, it's contributing, and it's compliance. And in, it all starts with consumption. If we didn't consume any open source, we would not need to contribute to any open source, right? That's where it all starts. So we use open source, that leads to need to contribute. But we need to do all this with good compliance. That's not the need to have for any, or, or a good to have. It's a need to have for us to be able to do this in, in a good way. We need to do it with good processes. So some of the risks we talk about internally with the Ericsson are, are sort of, these and and you will see IPR as in in intellectual property rights are sort of on, on both sides here and something that needs to be managed and or and a risk that needs to be understood. Um, the fun thing is when when sort of when we add in the context of MNAs, then we're not only then we're dealing with all of this, but we're dealing with all of it as once for companies we acquire, right? So in that context. Uh, we're dealing with a company, all of our companies old since. And I have another talk that I have done another time on sort of how is open chain useful as a tool in MA transactions. Those of you that, those of you, if you will attend the Open Compliance Summit, I think there is, is a panel on that as well, uh, if you're interested. And I hope you're able to join us for that. So that's the context. That's sort of Ericsson's view on, on we have a lot of IP assets, we're using a lot of open source. Uh, and we need to balance the needs of the company here. So how do we get sort of understanding on both sides here? Uh, and here we have open chain as sort of one of the, the solutions and one of the, uh, the ways to address this. Uh, so what we have is, I'm just gonna quickly go over open chain and then we're gonna try to translate this into IP language and IP speak, if you will. So. What open chain sort of dictates, it doesn't dictate the how, right? It just dictates what, what on a high level, what do you need, right? But it doesn't go into exactly what you should do. So for example, if we take a stupid example here on the first bullet, it's the organization has an open source policy. Okay, but open chain will not tell you what that open source policy should be. That open source policy in to be conformant with this might very well be no use of open source at all. That's our policy. I mean, it, it's a valid policy according to this. It's a bad policy, but that's that's up for you to decide, right? What you want in your company. You can still be conformant with such a policy, 
it's not a very good policy, but Open Chain doesn't go in to tell you the why it's a bad policy or what your policy should be. It just says you should have a policy. And the same goes for that st the relevant staff has undergone training related to open source. It doesn't go into the details of what that training should be or what it should cover or what it should look like. There should be training and you need to define what the relevant staff is for how you scope your program. Uh, we offer training material. Uh, I think ARM very generously a few years ago uh, uh, contributed their entire training deck to OpenChain. So anyone can go online and, and find ready-made material, but we're not going to tell you that you need to have used this training. You can develop your own training, cover, cover the things that are relevant for your company and your situation, right? Uh, OpenChain also says there should be a process for addressing open source software compliance in inbound software, the software we consume. I think that's very, very reasonable. And there should be a process for addressing open source software compliance during internal development and also for addressing open source software compliance in outbound products and services so that we cover the entire chain here in, in terms of, um, of, open source license, of open source software compliance. <coughs> then there should be a process for managing outbound open source contributions. Again, we don't tell you what that process should be like. We assess you should have a process. If your process is every engineer is free to contribute to any project they like, that's a valid process, that's good, you can have that. Um, and then there should be documentation on how do we accomplish this? How do we go about, um, how are all these things done? That should be documented. Uh, and there should be open source compliance artifacts that are structured, sort of, that the proof of this should be structured the same as every other company using the standard so that we can easily verify if you're compliant to the standard. Because what we have in OpenChain is that it's a self-certification. We have external certification available, but the baseline is that you certify yourself, right? And then it's up to your customers to see, oh, you're, you're conformant to this, you say, can we see your, your um, conformance artifacts or compliance artifacts so we can verify that you are conformant. And that way sort of the market takes care of, of setting a minimum accepted bar in, in that context, right? Touch more on that, that later. So what is sort of the intellectual property issues with open source? I would say one is that open source is seen as scary. It's the scary thing they don't, we don't really understand, right? It's a very different IP mindset and culture. There's very little common language between traditional IP management professionals and the open source community. There are often very different or slightly different uh, missions in these organizations. It's to some degree, it's different ideolo ideo ideologies, that was a hard word, um, between the organizations. And open source is fundamentally, it's based on copyright. And that's a very hard IP right to manage because it's not a registered right, it, it just exists, right? So I don't think anyone here can honestly say that they know about all the copyright their company holds because it's not registered anywhere. It's not, it's not actively managed in the same way as a patent where you, every year you need to pay to keep the patent alive, right? That gives you an incentive to actively manage these assets. But with copyright, it's, we have everything. It's, it's just there, it's managed, right? So we're gonna cover a little bit on, on sort of how to resolve those issues, but I'm gonna give you a sort of quick translation guide here for, um, for open chain to IP management or IP language, if you will. So we covered that the organization has an open source policy, okay. So in IP management terms, this means that the company accepts, uh, the company at the policy level sets what third party de IP dependencies are we willing to accept? Because in IP terms, open source is, it's not a software asset, it's, it's not that. It just represents IP that is external to the company <coughs> that we have a dependency on. So third party IP dependency. Sorry. So here it's just with the policy, we say, okay, we are willing to accept third party IP dependencies if they're under permissive licenses, perhaps. But we're not willing to accept um, copyleft uh, terms for our third party IP dependencies. Or we go more detailed and say, ah, oh, we're 
willing to accept copyleft provisions, but not <coughs> not if they have a network trigger such as ADPL, and not in in this particular product. So secondly, the relevant staff has undergone training related to open source. So in IP terms, it's that IP managers needs to understand this third party IP dependency to make you know, informed decisions and not decisions based on, on the wrong facts. They need to understand it. Perhaps not everyone in the IP department or patent department needs to understand that. <coughs> but at least to some degree, people do need to understand it so that there's someone who really understands that. And that goes to address the first point we had before, that open source is scary. If you know about it, it's not scary. It might be detailed and might be complex and complicated, but it's not scary. So the third point here in that there is a process for addressing open source software compliance for inbound software. It's that's just about making sure that IP risks in terms of compliance risks are managed already when you bring in the software, right? So already as, as early as possible, you manage these risks. And when managing them in, um, in, in the product internal development, then it's about managing it in each specific use case. So intake, okay, then we have this specific use case. Does that bring us any particular uh, IP risk problems? Okay, then we manage it there. And then finally managing it in, when, in the released product, okay? That's making sure that IP risks are managed in each uh, when, when we release it to the market so that we have through the entire chain managed IP risk. And to some degree, I think most here that, that has a patent department or an IP team, they are doing this for your products anyhow, but they probably don't have open source and open source compliance as part of that process because they need to make sure that they have secured the adequate licenses to put the product on the market. It might be trademark licenses. It might be uh, licenses for proprietary software and it might be patent licenses they need, but they probably have a process to manage IP risk. It's just about getting open source and open source license compliance into that process, or at least make sure that they know about it and they care about it and that they sort of support you in managing that risk so that they see that this is a risk they should care about. And it's, it's a risk that fits well into their existing structure. And finally, the, the part about the open source contributions and having a process for that, that's about ensuring that if, if you have valuable patents that you agree is not, would not be better off in, in an open source setting. It might be where you intend to keep a competitive advantage or you actually intend to exclude because that's where you build on top. Then of course there should be a process that ensures that no unintended IP leakage happens. And I think that's where most IP organizations are afraid with open source that they, they see that if we contribute, we would lose these assets. Again, it's about the information that that risk is, is limited in most cases to what you actually contribute and you're in control and you can put these processes. They shouldn't be too heavy because that hinders contribution, but there should be some process that gives sort of peace of mind to everyone, right? And finally, that there is documentation for all of how all of this is accomplished. In lawyer terms, that's about, excuse my language, covering your ass to make sure that I have documented all these things. There's documentations all the way for all of this. So no one can come after me and claim I didn't do anything or that we didn't have a process because it's documented. So what's the IP solution then in, in terms of what's scary? So what's, what's the IP solution? I will think that either you can go with saying that open source is here to stay, deal with it. I don't think that's necessarily sort of very productive. Um, Instead, I think that creating allies out of the, the patent department or the IP department, ultimate, because ultimately you share a goal in reducing risk and open source license compliance is about reducing risk. It, it's about us doing the right thing, but for the company, it's about us reducing risk for them, right? Uh, and the more mature the, the IP department is, the easier is that conversation. I mean, I think everyone or most here is familiar with the OSPO maturity model. I think there's a similar model for IP departments. 
but I think the, the more mature the hospital, the more mature the, um, the IP department. Um, I think we are probably better off speaking to each other at that level. If one is very immature and one is very mature, then there is, is a disalignment in sort of the levels people are talking at. Uh, so I'll, I'll skip this, but but the IP department's uh, maturity model then, we can compare that to the, um, the OSPO maturity model. But essentially, I mean, stage zero, that's establishing an IP department. I think that with OSPOs, we probably will get to the same state with us with an IP department. It's just something you have, right? It's just good operations. Someone needs to manage that. Uh, I don't think there's any major company today that questions the need to have an IP department or a patent department that manages patents and trademarks and trade secrets. Uh, hopefully we would get there with uh, with OSPOs as well. It's not something that's questioned. It's, it's just part of good operation. If it's called an OSPO, if it's called an open source office, if it's called the open source group, that's less important, right? But but having somewhere where you manage open source. Um, Hopefully we get there. So stage one of the maturity model is really having an IP strategy. Just on pat patent, not just anything that's patentable, right? Because I think most most companies have more patentable ideas than they have budget to file patents. And there's a good reason for that. You don't need to patent every idea. It, it's no point. It should support your strategy. Uh, second stage is very similar to, um, to the OSPO stage. It's about providing IP education, awareness, and services internally making sure that people are aware that, that they should file patents and, and sort of how they can be used in the business. Third stage is viewing IP as a business asset that can create value slash licensing income. But the fourth stage I would say is exactly I identical to the, um, to the OSPO model in terms of leadership that become a strategic business decision making partner for the company and for the other parts of the company. And here I will say it would be especially important to become that to the OSPO and for the OSPO to be a strategic partner for the IP department. I will say we are not there <laughs> with Ericsson, but I, I would like us to get there. Um, further, some addressing some of the concerns here that open source is scary. We said education, right? Educate your IP organization. Uh, they should be part of your open chain education program if they are not already. At least some of the managers should be. Uh, so that they get an understanding for open source, what it is, what its potential benefits are. Um, then it's a very different, the, the part about a different mindset. I mean, find common values, agree to move forward with what's best for the business. Because in fact, sometimes there will be hard trade-offs that needs to be made. This is a valuable patent. Uh, if we make this open source contribution, that will be made freely available for anyone in this community. Okay, that's, that's a liability for the IP department, but the business value of making that contribution might be much, much higher in terms of what you get back, right? And sometimes the opposite might be true. The value of this patent is actually greater than, than the value of this contribution. So the, the, the idea is, is not to optimize for your team, it's to optimize for the company, right? And that's putting ego and short-sighted thinking aside, and that's very hard to do. Uh, but at least agreeing on that baseline is very good. Um, the fact that there's very little common language that exists between IP and open source, I think education there again, and using open chain as a common language and understanding that in terms of, of IP, uh, the ideo ideology of open source and the, the sort of all the touch of feeling good reasons why we should do open source doesn't apply, right? It, it's not really applicable to that. So it's about using Open Chain as sort of a very hard coded, hard coded translation guide essentially, and get an understanding that the IP team doesn't necessarily view open source as any different from anything else. It's it's just an IP dependency, a third party IP dependency, they not control. But where they the difference between normal IP dependencies is that they would have negotiated that. There would have been a negotiated contract that, that created that. You don't negotiate open source licenses. You take them as is. Uh, the other scary part here uh, that I didn't cover in this slide is probably the fact that a lot of these licenses, they lack sort of basic legal provisions. 
in terms of there's very few licenses that has you know a choice of law provision, right, or a conflict resolution clause, uh, or a penalties clause, except for for that your license is cancelled. Those are like very basic provisions that, as a lawyer, you're taught that all agreements should have these things. Very few open source licenses do, and for very good reason. I don't think we've seen any successful or major open source licenses that have a choice of law provision, for example. And I mean, that, that could be a liability, but it certainly helps with uptake. I think probably one of, if not the least successful open source licenses was the Erlang public license, which Ericsson released in 99. And it had the funny clause that the, in terms of dispute, the, the, the governing law was Swedish law and the where you should go to settle the matter was the Stockholm District Court. And I think that was part of hindering its uptake. Because if you're a lawyer at the Japanese or a Chinese or for that matter a US company, you look at this and like, Sweden, I don't know if that's where they make the chocolate or the watches or if that's IKEA. I know even less about their laws. I'm not going to recommend my client to use this because I don't know anything about it and I can't in good faith advise. I mean, you probably have more lawyers in the US than you have Swedish people. So uh, it, it just shows that it's not really a good idea to always craft the perfect license, right? It was a very good license from a legal point of view, from an open source point of view and an adoption point of view, horrible. And that's why we changed it to Apache some 20 years later, uh, perhaps a little bit too late, but, but at least we did it eventually. Um, so, sorry, that was sidetracked. Back, back to my slide here. Uh, on the different missions. So the IP team wants to maximize the value of the company's IP portfolio and protect that value. I think sort of here, the, the goal to come over that is really prove that making it available as open source is the best way to do that, that you get greater value from this IP by making it available because you will get all of these other benefits. And I were super happy with the Sony presentation uh, before just showing the value of data, right? And it's the same here. If you can have a data-driven approach to prove this, then I think you will have a very easy time convincing everyone because ultimately it's, it's what the IP team wants is just to maximize the IP. It's not that they don't want you to do things, they just want to maximize the value of the IP because that's the asset they're, they're there to protect. And if you can prove that this enhances the value of the IP, or at least it doesn't decrease the value of the IP, then I think everyone is happy different ideologies. I think it's sort of, sure, we have different approaches to things and collaborations, but fundamentally uh, we should share the same ultimate goal of success of the organization and the company we're in. So again, aligning on that fundamental and agreeing that sometimes it will mean that sort of your interest will have to stand back. Sometimes my interest will have to stand back and sometimes you know, the business unit's interest will have to stand back for sort of the greater good of the company. Um, and open source is, as I said, it's, it's copyright. It's fundamentally hard to manage that. But I think at least bringing it up that we probably have a large part of our IP assets in this company that is completely unmanaged because no one is taking overall responsibility for the IP that is open source. You are taking responsibility for the patents, for the trademarks, but those are easy to track, right? So we probably in the same way as we, we need to evolve to take uh, take data seriously and actively manage that. We need to actively manage uh, copyright and, and, and open source. So again, if I haven't already convinced you on on why open chain, I think it's, it's Japan proves this very well. There's a very, very active community around open chain uh, that could help you in adoption. And we have for, for example, for the IP topic, we have a white paper published that I co-wrote with a colleague. Uh, for other things, we have other resources. But the point here is you don't have to reinvent the wheel when adopting Open Chain. Uh, there's, there's so much already done. The GitHub is a, that we have is a great resource. It's somewhat unstructured and perhaps we should look at that, but it's still a great collection of resources. Um, and if you then in trying to adopt open chain, if you can get the IP or patent department on your side in this as a risk reduction tool, I think you will have gained a lot because they have access to different parts of the company and different parts of the organization you are probably don't have the same access to. 
so they can really help you champion in this. Uh, so another point of open chain is that I'm a lawyer by, by training, but probably not by profession these days, is lawyers are expensive. And to any lawyer in the room, I'm sorry, but that's the truth, right? We're very expensive. So they should spend less time uh, negotiating non-value ads with your customers. And non-value ads is like, what is good compliance? How should our open source compliance program look like? What should our SBOM look like? Instead saying, we're open chain conformant and we're gonna deliver you an SBOM according to this new SPDX profile, for example. That's, that's removing so much friction from the conversation. And I've been part of a lot of conversations uh, with our customers where it's sort of, we start from, from a position that they don't really understand open source, right? So we first need to convince them that it's not scary and we can use this. And having open chain as part of that discussion and showing that this is the industry standard, this is how people are managing this. You don't really need to be worried about us not managing this good or that we introduce any risk to you because we use the industry standard and in how we manage open source. Um, and for those of you that haven't joined OpenChain, um, especially if, if you're from, from industries that are sort of underrepresented in OpenChain, I think one of the reasons that Ericsson joined OpenChain is that we wanted to define to our industry what good, what good practices are in, in open source compliance. Uh, because otherwise, again, we will face different requirements from different customers in different parts of the industry requiring us to do different stuff. If we instead join up, we can define to the industry, these are best practices, this is how things should be done, and aligning everyone to that same vision. And again, it, it's about if, if you sort of require open chain from your, uh, your suppliers, I think it helps to have the credibility to be involved in this uh, and to be certified yourself, even if it's a self-certification, I think that really helps in, in your credibility. Uh, and finally again you don't have to go at this alone it's it's sort of the open chain community is definitely there to help you we have many many different working groups we have many many different um, uh, different forums for people to meet to talk uh, we have the open compliance summit next week where open chain is sort of one of the the major topics that will be discussed um, but this message rings true for the context of this talk as well that you don't have to do it alone in your company as well find allies in the company whose mission of risk reduction sort of resonates with your own and get them on your side for for the benefit of rolling op out open chain as a mechanism of risk reduction that could be the legal department that could be the ip department it could be your security team uh, and then looking at our uh, security specification because that's that's it's not a mirror image but it's very similar to to our license compliance spec. So if you adopt one, you will have a very easy journey adopting the others. So find those allies and find those communities internally whose mission and values aligns to your own. I think that will make a open chain adoption journey so much easier. Uh, at least it has done that in, uh, in, in our case, because then, then you get a far wider reach. Uh, so with that, any questions? <laughs> Thank you for the great presentation. And uh, I have one question. Uh, how is your OSPO configured? Who is involved in? Because uh, it's a little difficult to contact with between the OSPO to with the legal department, IP department. It's the first step for us. Yes, so, so our OSPO is from it, it's organized under the CTO office, a group function technology, and then we sit in the standardization group. I think the one of the ideas with that was that we realized that we need to do open source with sort of the same diligence and the same professionalism that we do that we do open standards. Uh, so that was one of the reasons to put there. There's other reasons as well. Uh, so if you're also is organized sort of from from IP or from legal, then I think you will have less of these problems, right? 
I, I still think that sort of depending on, on where you end up, you might still need to realign with them from time to time. But yes, definitely, I think this this is a problem and this is a view that comes partly at least from the fact that we are not organized and we're not founded with compliance as sort of the um, the first mission we had. It was just on the list of things we needed to do when we established. So we don't come from, from a license compliance um, baseline. So we were more like on, on the contribution and culture baseline without having done that thing first, which you know, could create some problems. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? If not, I will we'll give everyone five minutes earlier lives back and uh, five minutes earlier coffee. <laughs>